Hello and welcome to the Heart of Fiat Crucified Love. Today we're going to talk about angels because they are awesome. And um, I found a song, I didn't really have a song about angels, but the angels spend all of their time praising God in heaven, in the courts of heaven. So I found this and we will sing it at the beginning. Why do I do that all the time? Because I'm tired. <laughs> How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty, for my soul longs and even faints for you. For here my heart is satisfied within your presence. I sing beneath the shadow of your wings. Better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts and a thousand elsewhere. Better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts and a thousand elsewhere, than a thousand elsewhere. One thing I ask and I would seek To see your beauty To find you in the place your glory dwells One thing I ask and I would seek find you in the place your glory dwells. Better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts and a thousand elsewhere. Better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, Better is one day in your courts and a thousand elsewhere than a thousand elsewhere. Gabriel, Raphael, seraphim and cherubim, thrones and dominions, virtues and powers, principalities, archangels, guardian angels, Marcus, Martinez, and all the rest. Defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O princes of the heavenly host, by the divine power of God, thrust into hell, Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. By the intercession of St. Michael and the celestial choir of seraphim, may the Lord make us worthy to burn with the fire of perfect charity. By the intercession of St. Michael and the celestial choir of cherubim, May the Lord vouchsafe to grant us grace to leave the ways of wickedness, to run in the paths of Christian perfection. By the intercession of St. Michael and the celestial choir of thrones, may the Lord infuse into our hearts a true and sincere spirit of humility. 
by the intercession of St. Michael and the celestial choir of dominions, may the Lord give us grace to govern our senses and to subdue our unruly passions. By the intercession of St. Michael and the celestial choir of powers, may the Lord vouchsafe to protect our souls against the snares and the temptations of the devil. By the intercession of St. Michael and the celestial choir of virtues, may the Lord preserve us from evil and suffer us not to fall into temptation. By the intercession of St. Michael and the celestial choir of principalities, may God fill our souls with a true spirit of obedience. By the intercession of St. Michael and the celestial choir of archangels, May the Lord give us perseverance in faith and in all good works in order that we gain the glory of paradise. By the intercession of St. Michael and the celestial choir of angels, may the Lord grant us to be protected by them in this mortal life and conducted hereafter to eternal glory. O glorious Prince St. Michael, chief and commander of the heavenly hosts, guardian of souls, vanquisher of rebel spirits, servant in the house of the divine King and our admirable conductor, thou who dost shine with excellence and superhuman virtue, vouchsafe to deliver us from all evil, who turn to thee with confidence and enable us by thy gracious protection to serve God more and more faithfully every day. Angels of God, our guardians dear, to whom God's love commits us here, ever this day be at our sides to light and guard, to rule and guide. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I have a lot of prayers I want to pray today. At the end, we're going to do long, a long litany. I'm going to put a couple litanies together. But the angels are like my best friends. <laughs> and um, that angel of God prayer that we prayed, did, we, did I make the sign of the cross? I'm not sure. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Um, the angel of God prayer that we prayed at the end is so powerful. And, you know, it's a child's prayer um, that rhymes and you know it seems it might seem simplistic but one time when I was at an exorcism and we had prayed for hours and and it was um, a big struggle at the very end the exorcist led us all in the angel of God prayer and it was in praying that prayer that a whole slew of demons were cast out of the possessed man so I always go back and remember that, that sometimes, you know, God, God loves to crush evil with simplicity, with a childlike heart, right? With that purity. So I pray that angel of God prayer often. I, I must pray it a hundred times a day. Um, but I love our guardian angels, but we'll talk about guardian angels in a minute. Um, I want to talk about angels in general. You know, it's something that a lot of people don't think about. and. Um, you know, guardian angels, we all have angels with us at all times. From the moment, you know, we're conceived, God assigns a special angel to each one of us. So when you walk in a room or you meet somebody, you know, use your mind's eye to picture that person's angel there. And, you know, it's kind of a neat thing to grow accustomed to greeting the guardian angel of whoever you're with. Um, you know, when I was a hermit, I was used to being alone and Um, with God, you know, with purity. And evil was very difficult for me. And so I remember several years into my hermit life, when I was just being a hermit, um, having to travel to New York for a retreat. And I went through the airport and I hadn't been in an airport in years. And oh, the evil that I felt coming at me just from like the world and the sin and like when you're soaking with the blessed sacrament and solitude and the Eucharist for so long you just you grow accustomed to purity and um, I felt so much evil and I remember in the airport remembering you know um, 
each of these people, I was overwhelmed with the crowds and then with the evil, that each of these people that I'm meeting have a guardian angel with them. And heaven was with me in that airport. And it was really beautiful because that remembrance gave me strength as I traveled through the airport. Um, you know, we all have a special angel with us at all times. Um, and they're very, very powerful. Um, even just little guardian angels. So, um, and I say little because, you know, there's nine choirs of angels and, and the lowest type of angel is the guardian angel, but man, are they powerful. Um, just a quickly, another story here at the beginning is when I was in another exorcism once, um, the man was very volatile and had broken a chair and he was, I could barely hold him down with the priest and the other people there. And I had my arm, like body and my arm, like across him to help him from not just, you know, violently tearing the room up. And, um, he was coming at me in a very particular way and trying to hurt me. And, um, I started praying, like whispering, no one else in the room heard, but I started whispering to my guardian angel. And I years ago prayed about the name for my angel and I received one and um, I didn't particularly like it at first, but I looked up what it meant and it was very appropriate. And, um, and so I was calling him by name and I've grown to love it because I love him. Um, and, he, he, the man was coming up at me and he suddenly got thrown back down and bound to the chair. And he, you could see where it was like something invisible was holding him. And he started yelling um, the F word <laughs> at um, the name of my angel. And nobody else in the room understood what was going on. So, you know, we prayed and, you know, eventually Satan left. And at the very end, the exorcist looked up and he goes, I have one question for everyone here. Who in the world is, and he said the name of my angel. And I started laughing and I said, that's my guardian angel. I became afraid. So I whispered and I said, help me. And I said, called him by name. And, um, and everybody laughed because they had heard him being cursed by the evil one. But that can tell you the great power of even just a little guardian angel to protect us, right? So angels, um, they're all spirit. They don't have a body, right? And their nature is a spirit. Um, they're called an angel when they're sent. Their names excuse me, the name of an angel has to do with their function. So angel means like to be sent. So when they're sent, then they're called an angel. They're real persons, but they're completely spiritual. So like when we picture angels, and here I put some pictures. I don't, I want a huge statue of St. Michael like my dad has, um, but it's like $400, <laughs> so I don't have it. But um, I have a little one of Michael and a little one of Raphael, and I found a guardian angel picture here when I was looking through my stuff in the other room. And then I've got here, this is Michael and Gabriel, and it's an Orthodox um, picture, image of them. So I wanted to have something you could look at. Um, but when you picture an angel with like wings or something like that, they don't actually physically have bodies, but when they manifest themselves to human, they take on a form so that the humans can see them, right? And the wings are symbolic um, of, you know, the quickness of, of speed at which they can travel and um, of their humility of you know, um, lowering themselves and hiding their face the way that Moses put a veil on his face before God, you know, that, you know, the cherubim and the seraphim in front of God have their wings that, you know, shadow their face because it's an act of humility before God. But they're pure spirits and they possess sheer intelligence and will. So they're very intelligent, they have like pure intelligence and they do have a will. They do have a will. Um, St. Thomas Aquinas said that the angels are the most excellent of creatures because they bear the strongest resemblance to God. 
And the fourth Lateran Council, which is like a council in the church, said that they were created before man. So um, sometime, you know, when God was creating the heavens and the earth and all of humanity, you know, the angels were created first. And, you know, just a little note on that. Um, you know, you have the angels of God, which is what we're going to focus on and talk about. But then you have fallen angels, which is what Lucifer and Satan and the demons are. They were angels. But because angels do not reason the way that a human does, like in time, they comprehend something all at once. And their act of the will is perfect. So, you know, we, little by little, you know, as we grow through life, learn about God and have a opportunity to choose him. We're all granted, God wants everyone in heaven. He would grant heaven to everyone because he died on the cross to save everyone, right? He wants all of us in heaven. But we have to choose to accept that. And we do that through, you know, renouncing sin and choosing a life in accordance with his will. But the angels, they don't have to do that over time. So there was like one moment where they were given, they saw everything and they comprehended the totality of God's greatness and his will for them. And they could choose God or not. And that decision was not revocable because they had full knowledge. And you know, we don't have full knowledge here on earth completely. Um, and their will, it was like a perfect act of the will. So Satan, chose was the highest you know level of angels that he was a seraphim which is like of the nine choirs of the highest the highest level but he was prideful and some people you know some saints say that um he saw the plan of god that jesus would come as a low human not as an angel and that he would have to worship Jesus and he refused. He said, I will not serve. I will not accept this plan of God. He was prideful. And so he fell. And that's why, you know, angels can't really be redeemed. You know, Satan can't really end up in heaven someday because his he had full knowledge and he in kind of in an eternal moment chose against God. And then the other demons, you know, fell with him. They, you know, the angels that decided to choose against God, that's what they are. So what I'm teaching about angels is also true about the evil ones, but we're not going to focus on that because why? You know, like I've said before, they're drama kings and they would love to be the center of our attention. And there's really nothing to be benefited from thinking about um, evil. So um, what do we know about angels? You know, I just want to kind of go through a little bit of that. One, they're very powerful. God gives them the grace to have great power and it's God's power within them in order to protect humanity and to aid him in his work. They frequently brought messages to people. You know, we saw that in scripture when the angel came to Zechariah and the angel came to um, Hezekiah and the, the angel came to Mary and the angel came to G Joseph. Um, you know, the angel came to Daniel. There are, you know, the angels... They say, you know, came to Abraham when he, you know, the, they say three persons, but they're often represented as um, like that's a symbol of the Trinity. Or I've also heard, you know, that it's like three angels when you see an icon of that, that, you know, brought that special power of God to Abraham. So, you know, Raphael that, you know, came and spoke in the book of Tobit um, and, you know, a lot of times they are sent on to bring a message, right? They carry out some of God's judgments. They brought a plague upon Israel. Um, they smote, they were, they, it says that they were smiting the leaders of the Assyrian army. And like there's times in the Old Testament where they saw like legions and legions of angels come to the aid in a battle and they would fight the enemy and the enemy would be conquered. They struck King Herod dead because he did not give God glory. And in the book of Revelation, you know, they pour out the bowls of God's wrath upon the earth. And it says in Matthew and in Luke that when Jesus Christ returns, angels will return with him 
as a great army accompanying their king and their lord. Okay? They patrol the earth as God's representatives. We see that in Zechariah. That they, you know, they go around and they, you know, they kind of keep everything under control. They carry out powerful war against demonic forces. And we see that in Daniel. We'll talk about that passage of Daniel where it says that. And then in the book of Revelation, where you know Michael was, was sent and he battled with Satan and, and he struck him from heaven. John also records that an angel, right, seized the dragon, the ancient serpent who is a devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit. Angels glorify God for who he is in himself. And, you know, I will go through the nine choirs of angels, but, you know, the, like the seraphim, their whole purpose is praise and adoration of God. And, you know, angels can be in more than, like, they can be, they actually, they can't be in more than one place physically, but they always behold the face of God. So wherever they are, they're also like in the presence of God. So that's why Jesus says in the Gospels that, you know, um, when he speaks about the children and he said, you know, blessed are these children, their angels always behold the face of God in heaven, Right? They continually praise and, and, and adore God for his holiness. They glorify God as they witness his plan unfold. They're in love with God. They're in love with humanity. They love humanity as much as Satan hates humanity. And when they see God's will be done in a life, when they see a soul be saved, they praise and adore God for that beautiful work. And when they see the plan of God happening, like when Jesus was, you know, incarnate and born in Bethlehem, what happened? They filled the fields around the, the stable and the, you know, the manger where he was laying with, you know, um, songs of praise and adoration, singing glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to people of goodwill. And the shepherds saw that, right? Why were they doing that? They were praising God for his beautiful plan. In Luke chapter 15, Jesus says, There is joy before the angels of God over every sinner that repents. So that when they see someone turn away from sin and come back to God, they're praising and they're adoring God for that, right? And Peter tells us in 1 Peter that angels long to look into the glories of the plan of salvation as it works out in the lives of believers each day. Right? There are many stories in scripture where we see um, angelic battles going on. And, you know, we would look at the world differently if we realized the, you know, the forces of um, heaven and hell that are around us at all times, right? You know, humans are pretty egotistical and we think the center of the universe are people. And there are actually many, many, many more angels and demons around than there are humans. <laughs> and there is a constant battle going on around us between good and evil, right? And there are special angels assigned to cities and, you know, to, to people who have special missions. And in order to keep, you know, the order of nature going on. And I mean, there's, there's angels and demons everywhere. And... You know, it's interesting because I heard an exorcist talking once about what a selfless act it would be if people would take a few minutes every day and just pray a little bit against the power of evil. Because just as there's a hierarchy of angels, holy angels, to do God's will, and I'll explain that in a second, there's an evil hierarchy of um, demons that are, you know, planning and plotting against God's will. And if you as a human take your free will and you spend time, say five minutes, praying St. Michael prayers or the Angel of God prayer, or even, you know, you could pray a decade of the rosary in union with Our Lady, the Queen of the Angels, and offer it up so that God blinds and confuses and scatters the plans of the evil angels, the demons, 
that they're plotting against God's people. That, you know, it would be like an army being confused and thrown into, you know, disorder and not able to win a battle. That's what you can do. You're allowed to fight with the holy angels. There are angels at every mass. There are jillions of angels. When you go into the church, that church is not empty. When the blessed sacrament is there, it is full of holy angels praising and adoring God. If you can close your eyes and open the eyes of your mind and your heart, you will see this, especially the sanctuary around the, you know, the tabernacle full of, of um, angels praising and adoring God. And when, you know, Jesus died on Calvary, the angels stood there in horror and in adoration. And there were angels collecting that blood and praying along with his sacrifice. And those same angels are present at the Holy Mass. They're present at every Mass. And some of the saints have said that, and I'll read you some of their quotes at the end. What do we know about angels? They have an intellect and they have free will, but they don't reason like we do. They know everything through the light of God's infinite knowledge instantly being infused into their persons. They don't have to learn like us. In one minute, God's knowledge is infused into them. He possesses such penetration that he is able at one glance to take in the whole field of science lying open to his perception. So God can give him infused knowledge of everything having to do with whatever topic it is in one snap of time. No obscurity um, clouds his knowledge the way that obscurity or, you know, a cloud can cloud the knowledge of a human person. The good angels respect free will. They are free and they know God gave us a beautiful gift of free will. Um, evil angels, the demons, never respect free will. They always try to abuse you and make you bound and unfree. The work of the holy angels is to make you free and to use that freedom to choose God, right? And the good angels use their freedom to love. Why were we given freedom? So that we could love. And so the good angels love and they love man as much as Satan hates man. I said that already. They, they choose to love God with all of their being and they love man and they want to aid man. They're just, they wait for our free will to ask their, their you know, intervention in human affairs. What kind of language does an angel speak, right? St. Thomas Aquinas wrote a ton on angels. And if you're really interested, you can go read the Summa Theologica on it. <laughs> but he said there that um, angels talk to each other by a mere act of the will. So they just open their minds and reveal whatever idea they wish to convey to another of the same nature as themselves. You know, so all they have to do is will to communicate something to another angel and it's done. This angelic language or conversation is called illumination. And the lower orders of angels receive their understanding from those who are above them. The highest level of angels receive their understanding from God himself. So see, God loves order. And, you know, just as like there's, you know, people on earth who are put in authority over others, there's angels. So there are special angels of the highest level that receive their knowledge from God. And then they pass it on to their little brothers and sisters, you can think, you know, to the lower angels. And then those angels try to pass it on to the ones that are lower, right? This exchange of thought is stronger and clearer and more perfect than any human language. So the knowledge that's, that's given is more perfect and more secure and strong than anything that we can um, exchange through words, right? And unlike God who is omnipresent, God is everywhere at one time, right? Angels are finite creatures. They're not infinite. They, they were created, right? And so they're limited to one place at one time. 
Now, I said that they always behold the, you know, the face of God, but God is omnipresent. So they can be on earth praising God in heaven, but they can't be in my apartment and in your apartment at the same time. But I can send my angel to your apartment. Padre Pio used to send and receive people's angels all the time. And it can happen in one snap of time. I can say to my angel, please go tell this person or go tell this person's guardian angel to tell them something. And my angel can go in one, by just by thinking it and communicate that knowledge to somebody else's angel who then communicates it to their person. Or my angel himself can go to this person. And you know, how is that received? You know, all of a sudden, whoever it is I'm praying for or sending my angel to might have a thought. They're not gonna rarely, they're not gonna necessarily see an angel. It's happened, but rarely does that happen. Usually an angel will place a thought or like a whispered voice, you know, to that person. And, you know, they will be told what needs to be told. You know, Padre Pio used to use the angels to communicate all the time. So if the angels were omnipresent, if they were everywhere at once, then Michael wouldn't have had to come help in the book of Daniel, okay? Because in the book of Daniel, Gabriel is sent to help Daniel. And there's a passage, what is it, Daniel 10, chapter 10, verse 12 to 14, that he says, you know, um, I have come, Daniel, you know, my beloved son, because of your words, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me for 21 days. So there was an evil demon of Persia fighting Gabriel, who was coming to bring a message to, to Daniel from heaven. This is all real. You know, Daniel was praying, God sent Gabriel. Gabriel was fought with a demon that kept him from getting to Daniel. So God sent Michael to help Gabriel fight off the demon so that he could get to Daniel. This kind of stuff actually happens, right? And it says, Michael, one of the chief princes came to help me. So I left him there with the prince of the kingdom of Persia and came to make you understand what is to befall your people in the latter days? So he, Michael came and he said, okay, Michael, you fight evil. And he left Michael in a battle. And it, like imagine you and your, you know, your brother and your neighbor fighting. And, and your brother can't get away to go do what he needs to do. So you're sent to go and you fight and then your brother can get away because you're fighting that battle. That's what happened with Gabriel and Michael in the book of Daniel. So angels are not omnipresent. They're limited to time and space. What is their mode of transportation? They're present or localized in a particular place, not by reason of their own substance being coextended with and circumscribed by space. They're not in space, so to say, right? But by merely virtue of his power being applied to a specific object or a place. So the presence of an angel in a place is determined and sometimes made known by his activity there. You know, if an angel decides to do something in a particular place, that's how, you know, how he's present there is through that action. But only in one time and one place can he work. He's not omnipresent. And they move from place to place with the rapidity of thought. So all an angel would have to do is think, you know, I'm in California and he le he's not in Indiana anymore. He's in California. That's how quickly that they go with the rapidity of thought. Motion consists in transferring his attention and activity from one object to another without having to pass successful, successes, successively through the intermediate places and space. So he doesn't have to go from Indiana to Illinois to Iowa, right, to get to California. All he has to think about is California and he's there. That's how quickly angels can move. And all of this should give you great comfort because they're that powerful. They can move that quickly. They can communicate with anyone you love. So when you know of somebody suffering somewhere, even if they're on the other side of the world, 
You can send your angel to them, or you can talk to their angel. And God wants us to use angels. They're given as our great guardians and friends. Each angel has its own name and personality. An angel's name is its function, okay? So their name explains its own inner meaning. Each name of an angel mirrors a divine attribute of God, God's goodness, his strength, his love. And each angelic creature reveals an entirely new aspect of the eternal beauty and glory of God. They say that it's not like humans where we're all one species of humans, but we have different personalities. They say every angelic personality of each angel is so different. It's like a different species. Each angel is that unique. It's far, their personality is far superior to any human personality. Human beings differ from each other merely as individuals of the same species. But St. Thomas says that angels differ from each other specifically. So we can say there's no two angels of the same species, of its own kind. This fact implies a far more perfect individuality, a higher form of personality than is known to us. They're that unique, each one. And, you know, I've, I've heard some people say you shouldn't name an angel because you could name it a bad name and, and then you're calling on a demon. But, you know, Padre Pio said, give your angel a name. Develop a personal relationship with your, name, with your angel. It's just important that you give, make sure that the name you're calling your angel is a Christian name. Because if you pray for a name and a random word comes to you, it could be the name of a demon. And you don't want to be calling on demons. So if a name comes to you, you know, look it up. Make sure it's a Christian name. But then develop a relationship. And it probably will not be the real name, the heavenly name of your angel. Sometimes that happens, but it's very rare. But it might be just a name that helps you to develop a relationship with that personality of the personal angel that was given to you by God when you were created to help you. You know, their whole job is to have a relationship with you. They know you better than you know yourself. They've watched you since you were little, right? And they can really aid you in so many things. And God wants to, like, have them help you know his will and to be holy. And they, they want your guardian angels to fight evil. And you hear stories about angels, you know, saving people from drowning or, you know, all sorts of things. And I think that angels have more power the more that you call on them and the more that you develop a relationship with them. So you want to do that every day and you want to teach your children to pray that angel of God prayer every morning and every evening. And, you know, three examples of names of angels. St. Raphael in the Bible, he, his name means the healing of God. But he was sent by God to heal Tobiah's eyes. And to heal Sarah from, you know, everyone she married being murdered by Asmodeus, the demon, right? Um, so he was sent to bring healing. And so we pray to St. Raphael when we need healing. St. Gabriel means the strength of God. And he was sent as a special messenger to reveal the plan of God to Our Lady, to reveal the plan of God to Daniel, to reveal the plan of God to St. Joseph, right? But if his name means strength of God, he not only revealed the plan of God, but he somehow brought them strength and encouragement, right? Michael, the one who's most powerful against, you know, evil. And it's funny because Michael is an archangel. And the archangels are actually one of the lower realms. It's the eighth choir of angel. And, and Lucifer, who was the greatest angel, was a seraphim. How did one of the lower angels, you know, cast out a seraphim from heaven when he disobeyed and offended God? Well, Michael's name means who is like unto God. And Lucifer claimed to be like God, right? And then what did he do? You know, in the Garden of Eden, Satan, that devil that claimed to be like God, to be that arrogant, came to Eve and said, don't you want to be like God? Eat the fruit of the forbidden tree. 
and you will be like God. And what does Michael say? Michael defends us from evil. He says, who is like unto God? His being screams that question. Who is like unto God? So there are nine choirs of angels. And, you know, like I said, it's a hierarchy. It's an order. The highest form of angel are the seraphim. And they're directed to God and adoration of God. The name of seraphim means ardor or the burning ones, the inflaming ones. They are consumed with the fire of divine love of which they are created representations. You know, and that's why we talk about seraphic love. And I always pray that my heart may be full of seraphic love, right? That it will be as great of a fire of God's love as the seraphim. Their whole life is adoration. Their whole life is to bear love and light to the lesser choirs. So they're consumed with God and what they share with the lower angels is the light of God and the love of God. The love of God that keeps them glowing, keeps them close to the throne of the divine majesty. They're the closest to God's divine throne. But their profound humility, they're very, very humble. And their reverence interpose the screen of their wings between themselves and the super brilliant splendors of the glory of the Most High. That's where the, the idea of wings comes in with an angel, right? It's, it's that humility that, you know, I, I dare not show my face before such great, you know, brilliance as the glory of God. The primary duty of the seraphim is to sing without ceasing about the holiness of God. And so a seraphic person is a person whose life is completely ruled by divine love. That's where we get that from. And we can pray to the seraphim to make our love, you know, a, a fire and that we, you know, have a life full of adoration. The cherubim is the next level. And they have to do with the knowledge, the wisdom of God. And they're also given as a particular um, function of guarding holy places. You know, there was a cherubim that was placed in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve got cast out because the Garden of Eden was a holy place of paradise and they sinned. They weren't allowed to be there. And a seraphim or a cherubim guarded that, right? And we read about the Ark of the Covenant when it was, you know, um, the, a cherubim was placed around it to protect it, right? And so when there's something very holy, the cherubim protect it, but they're also known for wisdom and for knowledge. Their name signifies the fullness of knowledge. They're characterized by a deep insight into God's secrets, and they possess truly the fullness of the divine science of heaven. They know everything about heaven. They enlighten the lesser choirs of angels, and they are to them the voice of divine wisdom. God shares wisdom to the other angels through the cherubim. They're heavenly custodians and protectors of holy places and things. And St. Gregory the Great said that they are filled with a knowledge which is most perfect since they're allowed to behold the glory of God most closely because they're so close to God. That's how they get their knowledge. So the seraphim are the closest to God and they just burn with love and light. The cherubim are super close to God and they burn with a knowledge, a wisdom about his ways. Dionysus says that the name cherubim denotes their power of knowing and beholding God, their receptivity to the most high gift of light, their contemplation of the beauty of the divinity in its first manifestation. They are filled by participation in divine wisdom. And they outpour genu generously, bounteously to anyone below them, that fountain of wisdom. Imagine a fountain, right? Overflows with water. So they're overflowing with the wisdom of God to everyone below them. The thrones are the next. So it's the seraphim, the cherubim, the thrones. 
And they're very well known for um, peace, uh, uh, peace and humility. Um, yeah, their main characteristics are submission and peace. So we should pray to them for peace in our hearts and our families and our country and on earth and the church. God rests upon the thrones and in a certain manner conveys his spirit by these angels who then convey it to inferior angels and to men. So the thrones help us to submit to the will of God and they bring peace and they are also known for humility, right? And steadfastness is a characteristic of thrones. So when you need to be steadfast, to be faithful in something, pray to the throne. They're right. So the first, you know, three, the seraphim, the cherubim, and the thrones are all assigned towards the adoration of God, right? But the next three, which are the dominions, or some people say the dominations or the dominions, um, the virtues and the powers have to do with creation, order and omnipotence, the management of human affairs. So the dominations or the dominions, they rule over all the angelic orders charged with the execution of the commands of the great monarch of the heavenly father. So basically, they're in charge of ruling over what all the other angels do, right? They just have, they have authority to kind of organize that. These bright spirits make known to us the commands of God. And their main virtue is zeal for the maintenance of, the God, of God's authority. So they help us know God's will. They so want the will of God to be done on earth and in the life of men as it's done in heaven, that their main job is to make known the will of God, right? To maintain his authority, that we don't do our will, that we do the will of God, right? So when we're seeking God's will and we're really perplexed and we're discerning and we can't figure out God's will, we should pray to the dominions or the dominations. The virtue, they help kind of reveal his will. The virtues, on the other hand, help us to do God's will. So the dominions help us to know God's will. The virtues help us to fulfill God's will. They hear what the dominations or the dominions say and they they give us the grace to fulfill it and they like they you know hear the will of god and then they go and fulfill those orders to them is attributed the strength and we should ask their assistance when we're combating the enemies of our salvation so when we find something fighting against the will of god and we need strength we should pray to them it's through them that god governs the seasons the visible heavens and the elements in general. You know, all of creation is ruled by the, by the virtues. And they're in charge of it, but the lower angels actually carry out, you know, what they see needs to be done. We should pray to them in all of our necessities of mind and body and in time of public afflictions. They'll help us to do God's will. And they have a certain powerful, unshakable courage welling forth into all of what they do. They have their you know, great courage. So, you know, we've got, let's go over it again. The seraphim, the burning love, fire of God's love. The cherubim, the wisdom, the thrones, peace and humility. The dominions help us know God's will. The virtues help us have the courage and the strength to fulfill that will. Right? And then you have the powers, and the powers, special power, right, of the choir of powers, the angels of power, is to fight against the demons who are fighting against God's will. Every time God has a will, demons fight against it. So the powers are supposed to come, and when we call on them, they fight that battle for us. They're, they are the favorites among all mortals, right? All humans call on angels all the time to help fight their battle. It's the powers that we need. They're appointed in a special way to fight against the evil spirits and to defeat their wicked plans. 
When we see storms gathering in the church or in the state, in our, in our government, evil forming to resist those working for the glory of God, when we're doing a great work for God and evil is fighting against it, when there are extraordinary conspiracies to defeat some great good that's being planned for a diocese or a country or a city, then we should have great devotion and pray you know, fervently and frequently to all the order of powers in heaven that they may overturn and destroy the might and miserable plottings of hell. We should always pray to them in a special way. They fight against the evil spirits set out to destroy God's will. And then we have the three lowest levels, the principalities, the archangels, and the guardian angels. And it's funny that, you know, like I told you, the guardian angels are as powerful as they are because they're like supposed to be like the little guys, right? But um, that just tells you the great might we have in all of them, right? If the little guys have that much power, think about the power of the great guys, right? So the principalities, they preside over that third hierarchy of the principalities, archangels, and guardian angels. And they have um, a lot of executive duties in relation to men, the world of men. They're, you know, they help in a lot of corporal needs. They guard nations. And the execution of, um, you know, of God's will comes through them as they, they, you know, announce, imagine a general saying, you know, this is the will of the battle plan, right? The principalities announce the plan of God to man and, and over, you know, the area that's very corporal on earth. Um, especially they help leaders. So if you know anybody in authority, who has to make decisions, right? You can be bishops, it can be a president. You want to pray to them. They really help those who are put in a place of authority. We should invoke them for the protection of our country, that it may realize the will of God. And anybody who exercises authority should honor these blessed spirits. Because if you do, you'll receive from them graces of light and strength as you fulfill your duties. They also govern our souls and bodies, and they help us to attain our eternal desires. So maybe not something earthly, but when we have a supernatural eternal desire for something, they help us. They help people in authority. Their name signifies godlike princeliness and authoritativeness in an order which is holy and most fitting to the princely powers. Then we have the archangels, and the archangels are entrusted with the more important missions of men. They are often given as guardian angels to great people, like the Holy Father, cardinals, bishops, rulers of states, and others who have a special work to do for the glory of God on earth. Then they have an archangel as their guardian angel, right? They protect the church under the leadership of St. Michael, and they defend it against its enemies. And then we have our guardian angels, ordinary messengers sent to men and form their ranks of our own guardian angels or, cho oh, sorry, I, that sentence didn't make sense. They're ordinary messengers sent to men and um, that's the, the choir of angel that most people's guardian angels come from. They mirror in a very particular way the goodness of God towards us. They show God's goodness. And, you know, there was a woman I met once who was a mystic who had the gift of knowing the personality of your guardian angel. But God gives you guardian angels with a personality and traits similar to what you have and that you're called to. But it's like the perfection of them to help you grow in that. So it was interesting because she told me all about my guardian angel and it sounded like a description of me. And she, I never met her. I only talked to her once on the phone. But, you know, they, they're very good friends. Like, imagine somebody who, like, you know, thinks like you and acts like you. And, you know, that's who your guardian angel is. They are ever ready to go wherever the will of God sends them. They minister to all, to just and to sinners. So even if you're a great sinner, your angel wants to help you. They protect both physical and spiritual life. 
And the most important work they have is to help a man save their soul. There's no greater sadness, I'm sure, to an angel than for a man to lose their soul. They pray for us when we ask for their prayers, and they pray with us. They offer our prayers, suffering, and desires to the throne of God. When we pray, they come and, and take that up to heaven. They keep the devil away, or they at least restrain him from harming us. And they can go on errands for you. So we see angels all throughout scripture. We see them in Eden, right? I said that, you know, when Adam and Eve sinned and were cast out, God put an angel there. There's an angel that wrestled with Jacob in the Old Testament. Raphael, the archangel, came to heal Tobiah's eyes and to guide Tobit on his journey and to bless Sarah, to cast out the demon, to bring their marriage together. And what happened, you know, when he revealed himself, he said, I am Raphael, one of the seven archangels at the throne of God in heaven. And it was I, when you prayed and cried, who presented your tears and prayers to the throne of God. And God sent me to, as a remedy, as healing for your, you know, your suffering. And what did he say? I'm one of the seven archangels. And, you know, we know from scripture, three of them, Michael, Gabriel, and Raphael, you know, and there are churches to the seven archangels throughout the world. I know Europe has one in particular. Um, and the other ones have names. The only one that I'm very familiar with is Uriel. Um, oh, and then there's Shealtiel, I think, is like the burning fire of God. Um, but there are, you know... One of them particularly helps in marriages, I think. Um, but the only ones that we actually know from Scripture are Michael, Gabriel, and Raphael. There's Gabriel that's sent to Daniel in, um, in the, you know, the book of Daniel. And, you know, when, the men, when um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are thrown into the fiery furnace, what happens? The king looks down and he sees angels, you know, that there are four men in there and one looks like a son of man. Well, yeah. You know, there's another time where they, you know, in the Old Testament when they were fighting and they look up and they see this legions and legions of sons of God coming to fight with them. Those are angels. And angels came to Mary to announce, you know, the conception and the coming of Jesus. Angels came to Joseph to guide him in a dream and to save Jesus' life. An angel appeared to Zechariah and foretold John the Baptist. And angels came when Jesus was born to the shepherds. And when Jesus started his ministry, what happened? He was led into the desert and Satan, the evil Lucifer angel, came to tempt Jesus. And he even used the angels against him. He said, throw, you know, scripture says that the angels won't let you, you know, fall and be harmed. So throw yourself off this cliff, off this building and this precipice and the angels will catch you. And what did Jesus say? You don't test God, right? And after he overcame Satan, God sent angels to minister to Jesus in the desert. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was in such agony and nobody was awake with him. That what happened, God sent an angel to comfort Jesus in Gethsemane. And in the resurrection accounts, angels appeared to the apostles and to the women, to Mary Magdalene, and, you know, and said, you know, you are looking for Jesus who was crucified, but he is not here. And in, in the Acts of the Apostles, angels came and led Peter out of prison, right? And we see angels all over the book of Revelation. You know, the angels also lived with the saints. Padre Pio, like I said, had a great relationship with his angel. And people used to say to him, you know, Padre Pio would say, you know, I'll ask your angel or I'll send your angel. And, you know, people would say, do you hear them? And Padre Pio would retort, what, do you think I'm deaf? <laughs> you know, he heard and spoke to the angels just like men. St. Gemma Gilgani had a powerful relationship with her guardian angel. St. Joan of Arc had a powerful relationship with St. Michael. You know, the children of Fatima, what happened? An angel brought them the Eucharist from heaven in their, you know, in their first apparitions. And if we become like children, then that really pleases God. And what did Jesus say? You know, children's angels behold the face of God forever. They're seraphic. And, you know, that it, it brings such joy and rejoicing to the angels of children because children are pure at heart. 
St. Bonaventure says that all the angels in heaven are begging our Blessed Lady in her graciousness to honor them with some of her commands. And St. Augustine said that even St. Michael is always anxiously awaiting the honor of going at Our Lady's bidding to render service to her. She is the queen of all angels. So if you need extra special angels, ask Our Lady, the queen of angels, to send them to you. St. Leo the Great said, make friends with the holy angels and we shall find in them the most loving companions in our earthly exile. They will be our champions against the malice and the rage of the devils. They will be our advocates at the judgment seat of God and our amiable companions in bliss and glory throughout the endless eternity. And you know, Pope St. Leo the 13th, Pope Leo the 13th, um, had a vision at the end of, you know, the 1800s of a great evil that was going to come upon the world for a hundred years and the reign that Satan would have. And that's when he wrote the St. Michael prayer and he asked that it be prayed after every mass. And then, you know, after Vatican II, people fell away from that. And like, thankfully in our diocese, Bishop, you know, finally asked the priests to do that again. And in most churches, they're doing that. You should, because if the church invokes St. Michael to protect us after every mass, great powers of protection are unleashed, right? There are many different prayers to St. Michael. At the beginning, I prayed that prayer of the chaplet of St. Michael. And, you know, this, this little blue book, the Pieta, this is probably my 12th or 13th since I was 16 years old. I go through them like socks. Um, they have a beautiful chaplet in there. You can find a chaplet to St. Michael that Mother, or, uh, Mother Angelica does on YouTube, you know. Um, and I think it's similar prayers. There are, you know, all sorts of, of beautiful prayers you can pray to the angels if you look them up. I will pray a litany at the end. And if you want more information than the little bit I'm able to share, St. John Paul II wrote an entire address on angels. Just Google John Paul II's, you know, wor written work on the angels. And it's, it's very powerful and very beautiful. Right here at the end, I just wanted to go over a few places specifically in scripture that speak about the angels. And then a few quotes from the saints, and then we'll be done. In Colossians, it says 1.16, For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. Those are all types of angels. All things were created through him and for him. So the angels were created through God and for God. In the book of Job, it says in chapter 38, you know, the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. And he says, you know, who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Brace yourself, man, and I will question you. Were you there when I laid the earth's foundation? Were you there when the morning stars, which are the angels, sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? That tells you that the angels were made before man, right? You know, in Luke, you know, Jesus talks about how angels don't marry, right? And how we will be made like angels. We won't be angels because we will have corporal bodies, but we would be like the angels in heaven, right? Jesus says, those who are considered worthy of taking part in the age to come and in the resurrection from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will no longer die for they will be like the angels. In the book of um, Revelation, it says each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under their wings. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come, right? Another place in Revelation, it says, I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. In Luke, it talks about 
You know, in the same way, there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Another place in Job, an angel actually spoke to him. This is in chapter 4, and it said, A form stood before my eyes, and I heard a hushed voice. That's the kind of voice an angel speaks in, right? A hushed voice. Can a mortal be more righteous than God? Can even a strong man be more pure than his maker? Who is like unto God, right? Kind of like Michael. And in Jude, the book of Jude, it says, The angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their proper dwelling, these he has kept in darkness, bound with the everlasting chains for the judgment of the great day. It's talking about the fall of the angels, right? In Hebrews, it says, You have come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly. It's real beautiful. Another place in Revelation. And I looked and heard a voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and tens thousands upon ten thousands. The angels encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and in a loud voice they said, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. In Psalm 91 it says, For God will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all of your ways. It's a promise. And Jesus himself talks about the end of the age, the work of the angels, right? In Matthew 24, 31 to 35. He will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things, the angels gathering the people, right? You know that it's near, right at the door. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. And probably my favorite passage about the angels is Hebrews 13, 2. I think about it all the time. It says, Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. When I used to meet homeless people on the street who needed something, right? Especially that, you know, or like showing hospitality to strangers in one way or another. I always wondered, is this really a person or is this an angel? Is this a test, right? You never know when God is sending an angel to test you. You never want to turn them away. And a few saint quotes. St. John Chrysostom says, When Mass is being celebrated, the sanctuary is filled with countless angels who adore the divine victim immolated on the altar. St. Basil the Great said, Beside each believer stands an angel as a protector and a shepherd, leading him to life. St. Robert Bellarmine says, Those closest to God in heaven, the seraphim, are called the fiery ones, because more than the other angels, they take their fervor and ardor from the intense fire of God. St. John Bosco says, When tempted, invoke your angel. He is more eager to help you than you are to be helped. Ignore the devil and do not be afraid of him. He trembles and flees at the sight of your guardian angel. Your guardian angel is very powerful. St. John Vianney says, How happy is that guardian angel who accompanies his soul to Mass? You actually give joy to the angels by going to Mass. St. Bernard of Clairvaux says, We should show our affection for the angels. For one day they will be our co-heirs, just as here below they are our guardians and trustees appointed and set over us by the Father. St. Francis de Sales says, Make yourself familiar with the angels. Behold them frequently in spirit. You know, picture them there. Without being seen, they are always present with you. St. Faustina said, I have great reverence for St. Michael the Archangel. He had no example to follow in doing the will of God, yet he did it perfectly and faithfully. 
St. Alphonsus Liguori says, the powers of hell will assail the dying Christian. So at the moment of death, Satan will come. But his angel guardian will come to console and protect him. His patrons and St. Michael, who has been appointed by God to defend his faithful servants in their last combat with the devils, will come to his aid. St. John Bosco says, ask your angel to console and assist you in your last moments. So I hope that this kind of makes you think more about the angels and your personal guardian angel than you ever did before. I love them a lot. And I'm going to combine a couple different um, litanies. It's going to be a little bit longer, but we're just going to pray to the angels and hopefully, you know, their presence will come powerfully upon us. So, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Lord of mercy, Christ of mercy, Lord of mercy, Christ hear us, Christ graciously hear us. God, the Father of heaven, have mercy on us. God, the Son, Redeemer of the world, have mercy on us. God, the Holy Spirit, have mercy on us. Holy Trinity, one God, have mercy on us. Holy Mary, Queen of the angels, pray for us. Holy Mother of God, pray for us. Holy Virgin of Virgins, pray for us. Saint Michael, who was ever the defender of the people of God, pray for us. Michael, who drove from heaven Lucifer and his rebel crew, pray for us. Michael, who cast down to hell the accuser of our brethren, pray for us. Gabriel, who expounded to Daniel the heavenly wisdom, pray for us. Gabriel, who foretold to Zachary the birth and ministry of John the Baptist, pray for us. Gabriel, who announced to the Blessed Mary the incarnation of the divine word, pray for us. Raphael, who led Tobias safely through his journey to his home again, pray for us. Raphael, who delivered Sarah from the devil, pray for us. Raphael, who restored this sight to Tobias the elder, pray for us. All you holy angels who stand around the high and lofty throne of God, pray for us. You who cry to him continually, holy, 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 pray for us. You who dispel the darkness of our minds and give us light, pray for us. You who are the messengers of heavenly things, pray for us. You who have been appointed by God to be our guardians, pray for us. You who always behold the face of our Father who's in heaven, pray for us. You who rejoice over one sinner doing penance, pray for us. You who struck the Sodomites with blindness, pray for us. You who led Lot out of the midst of the ungodly, pray for us. You who ascended and descended on the ladder of Jacob, pray for us. You who delivered the divine law to Moses on Mount Sinai, pray for us. You who brought good tidings when Christ was born, pray for us. You who ministered to him in the desert, pray for us. You who comforted him in his agony, pray for us. You who sat in white garments at his sepulcher, pray for us. You who appeared to the disciples as he went up to heaven, pray for us. You who shall go before him bearing the standard of the cross when he comes to judgment, pray for us. You who shall gather together the elect at the end of the world, pray for us. You who shall separate the wicked from among the just, pray for us. You who offer to God the prayers of those who pray, pray for us. You who assist at the hour of death, pray for us. You who carried Lazarus into Abraham's bosom, pray for us. You who conducted to heaven the souls of the just, pray for us. You who perform signs and wonders by the power of God, pray for us. You who are sent to minister for those who shall receive the inheritance of salvation, pray for us. You who are set over kingdoms and provinces, pray for us. You who have often put to flight armies of enemies, pray for us. You who have often delivered God's servants from prison and other perils of life, pray for us. You who have often consoled the holy martyrs in their torments, pray for us. You who are wont to cherish with peculiar care the prelates prelates and princes of the church, pray for us. All you holy orders of blessed spirits, pray for us. From all dangers, deliver us, Lord. From the snares of the devil, deliver us, Lord. From heresy and schism, deliver us, Lord. From plague, famine, and war, deliver us for. From sudden and unlooked-for death, pray, deliver us, Lord. 
from everlasting death, deliver us, Lord. We sinners beseech thee to hear us. Through the holy angels, we beseech thee to hear us. That thou would spare us, we beseech thee, hear us. That thou would pardon us, we beseech thee, hear us. That thou would govern and preserve thy holy church, we beseech thee, hear us. That thou would protect our apostolic, uh, apostolic prelate and the ecclesiastical orders, we beseech thee, hear us. That thou would grant peace and security to kings and Christian princes, we beseech thee, hear us. That thou would give and preserve the fruits on earth, we beseech thee, hear us. That thou would grant eternal rest to all the faithful departed, we beseech thee, hear us. Bless the Lord, all ye angels, who are mighty in strength, who fulfill his commands, hearken to the voice of his words. He has given his angels charge concerning thee, to keep thee in all of thy ways. St. Gabriel, glorious archangel, pray for us. St. Gabriel, strength of God, pray for us. St. Gabriel, who stands before the throne of God, pray for us. St. Gabriel, model of prayer, pray for us. St. Gabriel, herald of the incarnation, pray for us. St. Gabriel, who revealed the glories of Mary, pray for us. St. Gabriel, prince of heaven, pray for us. St. Gabriel, ambassador of the Most High, pray for us. St. Gabriel, guardian of the Immaculate Virgin, pray for us. St. Gabriel, who foretold the greatness of Jesus, pray for us. St. Gabriel, the peace and light of our souls, pray for us. St. Gabriel, scourge of unbelievers, pray for us. St. Gabriel, admirable teacher, pray for us. St. Gabriel, strength of the just, pray for us. St. Gabriel, protector of the faithful, pray for us. St. Gabriel, first adorer of the divine word, pray for us. St. Gabriel, defender of the faith, pray for us. St. Gabriel, zealous for the honor of Jesus Christ, pray for us. St. Gabriel, whom the scriptures praise as the angel sent by God to Mary the Virgin, pray for us. St. Raphael, filled with the mercy of God, pray for us. St. Raphael, perfect adorer of the divine word, pray for us. St. Raphael, terror of demons, pray for us. St. Raphael, exterminator of vices, pray for us. St. Raphael, health of the sick, pray for us. St. Raphael, our refuge in our trials, pray for us. St. Raphael, guide of travelers, pray for us. St. Raphael, consoler of prisoners, pray for us. St. Raphael, joy of the sorrowful, pray for us. St. Raphael, filled with the zeal of the salvation of souls, pray for us. St. Raphael, whose name means medicine of God, pray for us. St. Raphael, lover of chastity, pray for us. St. Raphael, scourge of demons, pray for us. St. Raphael, in pest, famine, and war, pray for us. St. Raphael, angel of peace and prosperity, pray for us. St. Raphael, endowed with the grace of healing, pray for us. St. Raphael, sure guide in the paths of virtue and sanctification, pray for us. St. Raphael, help of all those who implore thy assistance, pray for us. St. Raphael, who was the guide and consolation of Tobias on his journey, pray for us. St. Raphael, whom the scriptures praise, Raphael, the holy angel of God, was sent to cure, pray for us. St. Raphael, our advocate, pray for us. St. Michael, pray for us. St. Michael, filled with the wisdom of God, pray for us. St. Michael, perfect adorer of the incarnate word, pray for us. St. Michael, crowned with honor and glory, pray for us. St. Michael, most powerful prince of the armies of the Lord, pray for us. St. Michael, standard bearer of the most holy trinity, pray for us. St. Michael, victor over Satan, pray for us. St. Michael, guardian of paradise, pray for us. St. Michael, guide and comforter of the people of Israel, pray for us. St. Michael, splendor and fortress of the church militant, pray for us. St. Michael, honor and joy of the church triumphant, pray for us. St. Michael, light of angels, pray for us. St. Michael, bulwark of all orthodox believers, pray for us. St. Michael, strength of those who fight under the standard of the cross, pray for us. St. Michael, light and confidence of souls at the hour of death, pray for us. St. Michael, our most sure aid, pray for us. St. Michael, our help in all adversities, pray for us. St. Michael, herald of the everlasting sentence, pray for us. St. Michael, consoler of souls detained in the flames of purgatory, pray for us. Thou whom the Lord charged to receive souls after death, pray for us. Michael, our prince and advocate, pray for us. Guardian angels, pray for us. Angel of heaven, who is my guardian, pray for us. 
Angel of heaven, whom we revere as superiors, pray for us. Angel of heaven, who gives us charitable counsel, pray for us. Angels of heaven, who gives us wise direction, pray for us. Angels of heaven, who takes the place of a tutor, pray for us. Angels of heaven, who loves us tenderly, pray for us. Angels of heaven, who are our consolers, pray for us. Angels of heaven, who are attached to us as good brothers, pray for us. Angels of heaven, who instruct us in the duties and truth of salvation, pray for us. Angels of heaven, who are to us charitable shepherds, pray for us. Angels of heaven, who are witnesses of our actions, pray for us. Angels of heaven, who help us in our undertakings, pray for us. Angels of heaven, who dust continually watch over us, pray for us. Angels of heaven, who intercedes for us, pray for us. Angels of heaven, who carries us in their, our hands, in thy hands, pray for us. Angels of heaven, who directs us in our ways, pray for us. Angels of heaven, who defends us with zeal, pray for us. Angels of heaven, who conducts us with wisdom, pray for us. Angels of heaven, who guards us from danger, pray for us. Angels of heaven, who dissipate the darkness and enlighten the mind, pray for us. Pray for us, guardian angels, that we may be worthy of the promises of Christ. O oh God, who does arrange the service of angels and men in a wonderful order, mercifully grant that our life may be protected on earth by all those who always do thy service in heaven. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who with thee in the unity of the Holy Spirit are one God now and forever. Amen. O oh God, who in thy unspeakable providence decided to send your angels to keep guard over us, Grant unto your supplicants that we may be continually defended by their protection and rejoice eternally in their society. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit forever and ever. Amen. Angels of God, our guardians dear, to whom God's love commits us here, ever this night, be at our sides, to light and guard, to rule, to protect, to defend, to enlighten, and to guide. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.